up, guys? I got um, one of my clients here, Zane Hodge from Z Canine Solutions. And Zane and I have been working together for a couple of months now. And uh, he's just here. He's going to share his experience with uh, working with me and uh, just kind of talk a little bit about running a dog training business. So Zane, why don't you just kind of kick it off for everybody and tell us all about, you know, how you got started as a trainer. Uh, so it's all started for me in uh, 2012, right out of high school. I joined the army and then in 2012, I was coming up on the end of my first contract. Um, and so I wanted to be a sniper. I was grew up in Wyoming shooting guns all the time. Um, so I wanted to be a sniper. So I went to our platoon sergeant and told him like, Hey, I want to go to specialty platoon so I can be a sniper. And he was like, no, you don't have enough time in yet. So, um, I finished out my third deployment there and then our dog handler was leaving. Um, so the first sergeant and the first, or and our uh, platoon sergeant pulled me into the office and they were like, Hey, our dog handlers leave in. You said you want to go to specialty platoons. Like, what do you think about being a dog handler? And I was like, I, <laughs> I wasn't like super happy about it. Cause yeah. I was like, dude, I don't really <laughs> like dogs that much, man. <laughs> uh, um, but I knew, you know, I knew I had kind of planned on getting out of the army at that point. So um, I knew that I had to find something that would be able to pay bills outside of that. Um, yeah. So I, I decided to do it. I went through my handlers, uh, my handlers course down in Fort Benning with uh, actually Julian McDonald and uh, another guy, Mark Kaufman. Mm -hmm. um, those were kind of my mentors starting out. Uh, Julian McDonald was the guy that um, his dog's name was Leka. He was all over uh, National Geographic and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Um, his dog ended up getting shot up in Afghanistan and he ended up saving her life. So, wow. um, he was actually in the in the that new movie uh, Dog that just came out. He wasn't in there very long, but he was Wait, kind what, of the. Uh, what movie is that? Wait, the one what is that the one with Channing Tatum? Yeah, yeah, it's the one with Channing Tatum. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone, everyone wanted a Malinois after watching that, and yeah, they can't have yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Should not have um, them. Yeah. So yeah, I did two more deployments as a dog handler, and then I got out. I chased a couple other jobs around. Um, didn't find anything that was like fulfilling and it was hard for me to leave mm -hmm. all those years of experience and, and knowledge behind. So, um, so I decided to go back to dog training. I went to the Tom Rose school for dog trainers, um, to learn more of like the pet side of things. Um, because in the military we were handed pretty much like finished dogs, you mm -hmm. know, so they pretty much are, they already knew how to do their job. It was just a matter of, it was just a matter of like maintaining that. Um, so I wasn't there for like the, the foundational building, um, you know, for any okay. of that. So I wanted to, I wanted to be able to train from the bottom up, you know? So mm -hmm. I went to the Tom Rose school and that's where I met Tommy Loveless. Um, right. he did that interview with you. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah, how we that's, got started together. You, you reached yeah. out to Tommy, right? You're like, is this guy a total scam artist or yeah. what? <laughs> Yeah, dude. I thought I was like, man, is this dude selling snake oil, dude? Or what? <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I reached out to him, um, and he said, like, hey, it's definitely worth it. It's worth giving a shot. But yeah, I went to the Tom Rose School, and then I moved out to Virginia um, to try and do some dog training out here. Yeah. What I had originally came out here for kind of fell through. Um, so then it was kind of up to my on my own to kind of get things going. So that's when. You know, I tried several different things, and by the time we got linked up, you know, I was kind of at my wits' end. Yeah. Um, you know, I I did pretty. I felt like I did pretty much everything that I I knew or that I thought was right. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, once we got linked up, man, everything changed for the better. Yeah. So so when when did you officially launch your business? What year? Um. It would have been 2017, I want to say. 2017, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I remember you sharing that with me, that you were like, I've been doing this for years, but you were kind of like having, you had some like decent months, right? But then there was just like a lot of time where that was just like downtime. And in fairness, like some of that time you were away touring the world with Taylor Swift, actually, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah. tell everyone about that real quick, because I just think that's such a such an awesome part of your story. 
Yeah, so um, so because the dog training wasn't paying the bills, I wasn't really doing like I wasn't making a whole lot of uh, you know money doing that. I had to look into other things. So because of my you know background in Second Ranger Battalion, um, because it's considered a special operations unit, that kind of opened the door for me for a couple other you know contract style jobs. Um, and so yeah, in 2018, they were looking to get some. Uh, some dog handlers together. They were beefing up security. So in 2018, Taylor Swift was going to go on her reputation stadium tour, right? In 2018. So yeah. a couple of years prior to that, Ariana Grande, um, there was a huge, there was a terrorist attack that happened. I at remember one this. Yeah. In Manchester. Yeah. Um, so Scott Swift, Taylor's dad, like did, every, he tried talking her out of going on tour because he was just so worried about it. Um, but he's, she like wouldn't back down so he was like well if you're going to go on if you're going to go on tour anyways then we're going to need to beef up security so they got a hold of a contracting company um and they pretty much the majority of us had been in special operations and there was like a couple guys that you know were law enforcement that were really good squared away guys mm. um so they got that team together i was part of the dog handling team so um I did a little bit of training, got my dog spun up on explosives. And then from March of 2018 to November, um, you know, I provided security as well as, you know, bomb detection. So yeah, got to travel all over the place. We went to Ireland, England, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, yeah. and then all over in the U S. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a pretty, pretty awesome story. And so, um, you in that time, like you were running your business, but you were kind of back and forth. And I always, I always think it's so funny when we talk about this because I remember the first time we were talking about it, you were like, I had my, my like five seconds of fame. Like you can see you're in like the background of like the, uh, of, is there like a documentary or something like that of like the tour? <laughs> yeah. On, uh, on Netflix, I actually, um, I think it's still up there. I don't know, but yeah. like, I knew they did the, they filmed it in, uh, in Texas at mm -hmm. one of the shows. And so we knew it was going to be on Netflix. And then they did like, they essentially rented out like a theater mm. so that like everybody on the crew and everything could see it. But because I was on security, like I'm standing there in the hallway, you know what I mean? And like a couple of my buddies were in there. I was like, dude, was I in it or what? You yeah. Know what I mean? um but yeah it came out my wife just like fast forward the like the whole thing <laughs> until she found me and she's like there you are um but yeah it was yeah cool. yeah i remember you saying to me you were like yeah like 19 minutes and 37 seconds <laughs> in you can see me or whatever it was yeah 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 that's fun, funny man. man but yeah so like you were running your business and like since the business wasn't fully like expanding and really going exactly where you wanted to, you kind of need to fill in the gaps like revenue wise with like jobs like this. Right. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, like running the business, I feel there's like a over glorification. It was what was really happening. Like mm. I get, you know, I'd have a couple clients to do like private lessons and stuff with the other thing too, is I didn't have, like we just bought this house like two years ago. So doing board and trains like wasn't even an option for me. So I was just right. like stuck to doing the, the private, private lessons. Yeah. Um, so it was like, I do private lessons, but I wasn't making enough money to like stay around. So then, you know, a contract gig would come up. So I would leave and it would like create this black hole of dog training. So then when I came back, it was like I had to, to restart everything because I right. didn't have anything going while I was away. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it was more or less I had an LLC so I could do like essentially get paid for dog training. Right. Um, even though it wasn't necessarily paying the bills. But yeah, right. that's how it, that's how it started out. Gotcha. And so like when you were if you were like trying to get clients like in your business before we started working together, like what were you doing? Like, were there, were there any things that you were trying to like bring in like clients every month? Yeah. So I, I was like trying to do everything. Right. So um, I was doing like a little bit of everything. Like I said, I didn't do like much research. So I was just like trying to like think of things that I could do. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of these was, um, a good friend of mine used to run or a person that I got to know anyways, when I moved out to Virginia, she ran a boarding facility. 
Um, so they didn't really offer any training. It was just boarding, but we started talking to one another and she was like, you know, Hey, like we don't do any training here. So I've got lots of clients that come through here. They're always asking, you know, for dog training advice and all that stuff. So he really helped me out. And I, uh, I ended up doing group classes and stuff out there for her. And then that led into like, you know, private lessons and then Mm -hmm. kind of word of mouth through that situation. Um, and then it, the majority of clients that I was pulling in were all like just word of mouth. So I'd go around to like, you know, the vet clinic that I was at, I ended up working with the the owner there. She had a dog that needed a little oh, bit cool. of help. So I helped her out. And then next thing you know, it was like, Hey, order some business cards so I can start giving out, you know, some information. So, you know, every couple of weeks I'd get a call from the vet's office or people, you know, just word of mouth clients and stuff yeah. like that. I was advertising on Craigslist. Like, you know, I was doing everything I could think of, yeah. you know, just to bring something in, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it was kind of yielding the same results for you. Like you were like, I, I I can't remember exactly the numbers you had given me at the time before we started working together. It was like a couple thousand bucks a month, right? From time to time, but it wasn't even super consistent in that regard. Yeah, right. Because everything was done like there was no packages. There was no right like extended like training or anything like that. It was literally just private lessons at a set rate plus mileage. And that was it. Right. And that's um, even something that you and I talked about and changed in the beginning was doing packages even for private lessons instead of selling one off like a la carte. Like, hey, you can buy a dog training lesson here or another one here. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and it definitely, gosh, dude, that made, I mean, ever, ever since we started working together, dude, it just made a world of difference. Like such small, such small changes made yeah. such, such a big impact. Um, That's great to hear, man. Yeah. Because I think that a lot of people think that like, they're going to need to have a cosmic shift in their business and the way that they do everything. Right. If like the way, but, but sometimes it's really just tweaking things, you know, and yeah. you can really start making way more money by just changing a couple of different things in the business. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, so it sounds like you had a very common experience with a lot of other trainers where it's like, you're trying to build relationships with, whether it's with the vet or like a local, um, you know, dog boarding facility or daycare or whatever it is. But the problem is I see it with that. It's like, there's zero predictability to that, right? Cause you're waiting on somebody else to refer you. And even if they have like the greatest intentions in the world and they're like, you know, Zane is the greatest dog trainer. I want to send everybody to you. You still don't have like any control over that. It's just kind of like random when they come in. Was that kind of your experience? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was, like I said, I had been here for kind of four years, right? So, yeah. you know, especially I was doing group classes and I think that was probably like, the best thing that I could have done at the time. Right. Uh, especially for word of mouth, because you're getting a lot of people in, yeah. they're getting results, and then you're kicking them back out into the world, you know? Right. And a lot of these people, you know, especially where I live, I, I don't live like really near like a really big city, right? So these people are coming from, you know, a couple different miles away. Not everybody lives in the same city, right? So, you know, all these people, you know, 50 to a hundred people run through your group class a year. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was relying on that in the beginning. You're absolutely right. It was a hundred percent like hit or miss. It was super inconsistent. Um, but about the time that I had reached out to you, I mean, I was hearing consistently, you know, every couple of weeks, every week or every other week, you know, I'd be getting some clients. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, you know, now, with the online advertising and stuff like that, it brings its own set of challenges, but yeah, I, I know there's not, you know, two or three days that's going to go by that I'm not going to get something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we had this, we started talking about a lot of this stuff even before we got on the call and we had to kind of save it for this call. So um, I'd love to get into that for, you know, in a second, but so prior to us like working together, like it was like probably like a, like a couple thousand bucks a month. And then pretty soon after, I think within like the first like 30 days, I kind of remember you saying to me, like you made like 11 grand or 14 grand or something like that. in like the first 30 days, right? Yeah. So when we first talked, it was like perfect timing because I was just finishing up some group classes mm-hmm. and when it rains, it pours, dude, we got on the phone. We like, we started working together and then you brought up the idea of, you know, boarding trains 
Um, and like kind of, you know, we talked a little bit over pricing and stuff like that. And so yeah. I was like, all right, let's change it. So in the first 30 days, I think I made like $26,000. Oh, um, really? Damn, I thought it was, I didn't realize it was that much. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of that was because I had like several people that had contacted me and they're like, Hey, we're interested in doing a board and train. Right. Right. So the way that I had been doing it is like, you know, okay, we can get you in in a week. Like, yeah, you know, and I can knock out as much as you want. Like I was doing, I was taking dogs, like didn't know anything to like pushing to do off leash stuff at the end yeah. of the week. It was just like, it was really stressful for me. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't, you know what I mean? Like it just wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you got to like, find your way. You got to find like what cool. works for you. You know, because yeah. like, it, I think that a lot of people do just start taking any dog, right? And they'll like, and they'll just, you can have the mindset when you first start a business and when you're getting it off the ground, you're like, I'm going to take on any client and I'm going to do whatever it takes to start making some money. But then like, that can be one of the quickest ways to burn yourselves out. So, yeah. And, you know, like I wanted to help other people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I wanted, you know, if someone calls me up and they're like, Hey, I'm having this issue, but you know, I can really only afford a thousand dollars, you know, but I want my dog to do off lease stuff. Like I would do my best to cram all that stuff into a week. And I'm glad that I had that experience because by the time that we talked and you're like, look, man, like you might look at doing like a two week minimum. Yeah. Um, And I was kind of reluctant and I kind of felt bad for some of the people, you know, but at the end of the day, it does yield like a much better result. Yeah, for sure. Cost a little bit more. You have a lot less of a chance of like ruining your reputation, you know, because there's things that I can do in a week. And the dog's like not 100% finished, but there's little things that you can pick up on that like if you don't pick up on this, the training's just going to go back to zero. You know right. what I mean? And it's going to look like you didn't do your job at all. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. So by giving them, you know, more time, you essentially, you know, make them idiot proof that you can just hand them to anybody. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, they may walk different. They may sound different. They may do things much different than I do. Right. But because, you know, the dog's got the reps and the experience in, it's going to be more of a seamless transition there. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, sometimes we can let our clients dictate the way that we run our business. And people are like, I, I need, I don't have the money to do that. And I, I need to do it this way. I can only pay for a week. But it doesn't mean that we need to take that client on because if they're setting unrealistic expectations for you, I think you hit the nail right on the head and then you can't really deliver on them. They're not going to be a raving fan of your business. Other people hear about that or something. And I don't want to be, this isn't like, I don't want to sound catastrophic, but it's kind of like you need to set yourself up for success, right? And if it takes two weeks, it takes two weeks. That's just the process, you know? And even, you know, and sometimes you just hit little bumps in the road that you don't really expect, you know, like, you know, I went over to a client's house one time and the dog was super happy and jumping up on me and, you know, really like seemed like really stable and normal. Mm -hmm. And I like handed the dog a piece of food, the dog ate. And I was like, all right, cool. Like I'll be able to knock this out quick. Um, I get the dog back home and it like, it just clams up like doesn't want anything to do with me it's like scared me all of a sudden you know what i mean doesn't want to go into kennels like i didn't really expect that you know so even an in-person kind of consultation like that i thought i could be able to do it in a week but then you know if the dog takes a while to warm up it's going to take a little bit longer so yeah giving yourself that extra room um you know it's only going to be better for you and it's going to be better for the client as well because like i said you get more of those repetitions in yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, you gotta you gotta go at your own pace and like do what's gonna work best for you because that's what's gonna cause like longevity in the business and let you have that staying power, right? Because at the end of the day, like word of mouth referrals are super powerful, and once you get that network built up of of like referrals, it's one of the greatest things in the world. People are coming to you; they're like ready to go. There's much less selling involved. Yeah. Um, so it's the greatest thing in the world, but you know, you just need to, in order to get there, I think what it all starts with is the results that you're delivering to people. Um, not to say that, you know, like you want to have a four week board and train to teach a dog how to walk on a leash. Like you got to be realistic <laughs> about it as well. Right. Like right, you got to yeah. deliver like good, fast, um, efficient results. Uh, but they got to be, you know, they got to be within a reasonable time frame. Um, so, you know, I'd love to talk about like where you're at right now some more. So you told me before we got on the call, like so far since we started working together, like 65 K in revenue, right. 
yeah. then over the last like 30 days, you said you were checking it yesterday and you were at about like 19K over the last like 30 days, right? And that fluctuates day to day based on like when you're running the report. Um, but you're booked out for the most part right now. Like you don't have a ton of space available, right? Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, I kind of got overbooked. I had to distro some workout, yeah. um, which is good. It's a great place to be in. Like when we first started working together, I know I told you like, you know, hey man, if we can pull in like four thousand yeah. dollars a month, you know, like I'd be good with that. So, yeah. you know, the fact that you know we're blowing past that, yeah. um, you know, it just creates. It's just, it's so much better in every way, man. Like I'm working yeah. with less dogs, I'm a lot less stressed out, and I'm making way more money. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I'm able to deliver results that make people happy. You know. Yeah. Um, it really, you know, it's. Sometimes I get too much in my head when I'm training these dogs sometimes. And then, you know, I'm like, dude, these people are going to be so mad. And then I give the dog back. I do the go home lesson. And then like a couple of days later, they're calling me like, dude, I can't believe like my life is so much easier yeah. now, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been, you know, as far as the, the money goes, like I think our, my, the lowest it's ever been was 4,000. Right. Um, and that was for like one day, you know what I mean? And then I get a right. whole bunch of calls that like board and trains, private lessons mm -hmm. um, and being able to stack those is just really phenomenal. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And, you know, money is one piece of the equation, you know, like that's got to I know that a lot of people start out there or like one of the easiest goals to pick and it makes the most sense. It's just like a financial goal. Like, hey, I want to be able to have this be a sustainable business that pays my bills and, you know, provides me with a nice, a nice lifestyle. And so a lot of people say that to me, or they're like, I want four or five grand, or I'd really be excited if I could make 6K in a month. And then you realize very quickly that you blow right past that. And you're like, maybe I should just keep going. Maybe I should like try and hire somebody. And you don't need to, but I just think that it's interesting. It's interesting how your standards can change very quickly, you know? And if you do a $10,000 a month, and then you do a $20,000 a month, then you start looking at it going like, you do $5,000 at one point, that's all you wanted. But now you're mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, if I'm not doing 10,000, I kind of feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm missing the mark or something like that. So, so are you looking to get somebody hired anytime soon? I know you kind of have somebody right now who is a uh, freelancer for you almost, right? Yeah. I'm not really like, I'm not, not looking for it, but I don't feel comfortable right now as far as like with the amount of work that I do have coming in, um, like this is the first time I feel like I'm kind of in over my head almost with mm. clients and stuff. So yeah. it's definitely, you know, before we even started this, that is something that I would have liked to do. Yeah. Um, it's something that I've always thought about doing, um, you know, is ultimately being able to distro workout because at the end of the day, when you work for yourself, you have to look at retirement, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that would be something. Exactly. So, Hey, listen, something I'd love to, to talk to you about and get and hear your opinion on is like your programs right now. Like, what are you, what are you selling to people? Cause I know this is something that trainers can sometimes struggle with, like how to construct programs, like how long the board and train should be, how much to charge for those. Like, so do you mind just walking us through kind of like what your current programs look like? Yeah. So I, like I, I know when we talked when we first started talking about this, I don't like making things complicated. I'm a pretty straightforward, simple kind of guy. Yeah. Um, so we had that conversation about dog, like puppies, right? Because I was getting lots of calls, like, "Hey, I got this eight week old puppy. Can yeah. you do a board and train?" And I'm like, <laughs> "No way do I want to take that on um, and wake up every three hours." So <laughs> um, we did. Uh, came up with a two week puppy program. Mm -hmm. Um, it's $500. We get together, you know, for the week, the way I explain it to people, we get together, um, you know, and we cover everything that has to deal with raising a puppy top to bottom yeah. and then an introduction to obedience. Right. So the first week, um, you know, we talk over everything, scheduling, when to create, when to feed, when to pull water, mm -hmm. things that you can do to make your life easier, how to address chewing, jumping, all that other stuff. Um, and then like start to build in like the foundation for obedience as far as like cool. the learn how to learn process. So the way I explain it to people, we get together on week one and then we cover all that. And then I give them homework for the rest of the week. Nice, and then man. Two, we do a little bit of troubleshooting if they had any issues. And then that's when we usually start like the foundational obedience stuff. Um, and then I give them, you know, essentially 
my goal is by the end of the two week puppy program is to have them equipped, you know, with them to have like a good nurturing system for the dog to where that. So they're ready when they get to like five or six, seven months old, if they want to continue training and do a board and train, I'm not having to like reteach all this stuff. It's just right. a real quick, the dogs already learned how to learn. So we can just hit the ground running um, and knock some obedience out, but it's pretty much just how to cultivate like a good living experience for a puppy. Yeah. Um, so that's the puppy program for the private lesson package. Um, it's a four week program. We get together four times once a week, same thing going over, um, you know, in detail, kind of what makes their life a little bit easier. And then sometimes what happens is like, you know, you get this stuff knocked out in like two weeks and then you're kind of like, well, I don't want to waste their time. You know yeah. what I mean? So there's been a couple of times that I'm like, Hey, you know, you're worried about how your dog is around other people or other dogs. So, you know, for the third and fourth lesson, like let's go meet at uh, Lowe's and we'll go through Lowe's together mm -hmm. or we'll go meet at like the downtown mall or something um, and take the dog out and about. So you can see, you know, the similarities and the differences. If you put the homework in at home, you know, how does, how does that look when you go out in public? Yeah. Um, and it's good to challenge the clients, you know, so that they see that like their dog can do stuff. And then when you go out in public, sometimes it changes a little bit. The For dog sure. might not be as great, but you'll be able to see, you know, how to work through that. So when the client has any issues in the future, you know what I mean? It's real easy for them to kind of work through that and troubleshoot it on their own because you've equipped them with the tools, you know, necessary to do so. Yeah. Um, so that's the, uh, the private lesson package for like older dogs. And then um, as far as the board and trains go, I do an on leash package and an off leash package. Nice. Um, yeah. The on leash program is two weeks long and it's just catered around, you know, what makes your life easier. Yep. Um, like I said, go, I'm a very simple guy. Like if, if I can just put my dog in a kennel instead of telling him to climb for 12 hours and having to like constantly check on him and back it up while there's a bunch of other stuff going on, like m most people aren't going to put that time and effort in, you know? Right. So I try and focus on things like, you know, what would you like to be able to do with your dog in the long term, right? Go on walks without your dog lunging like an idiot. Like right. that's stuff that I can help you with. <laughs> um, you know, some people go out on runs, right? Yeah. There, there was this lady that does like ultra marathons. She runs all over the place with her dog. And she's like, I really just need a recall. Um, you know, so I taught him how to heal and do all that. And then, you know, did some off leash stuff and doing like recalls and I'd take them on walks and runs and stuff back in the woods and then just call them to me. Um, so it's That's just awesome. catered around, you know, what makes their life easier. Um, and I find that like it, that makes that takes a little bit of the pressure off me, too, because. You know, if I have a client that's like, you know, I cannot walk my dog down the street without them barking, without them lunging, you know, and then I do a climb. Right. And like the dog's sitting on a platform, the client's like, that's cool. So I think you were just talking about um, you were talking about um, how you kind of tailor things to what people really want and how that makes you life easier. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if it, it's much easier to please the client if they're if they can't take their dog for a walk, you're like, yeah, you can get them to, you know, climb or sit at doorways or something like that. But if you can really target and focus what they actually need. Yeah. I mean, you spend the majority of your time on that and then that makes it easier and you have that much more, you know, that many more reps in during the boarding train because you're not yeah. wasting time doing stuff that the client's never going to use in the first place. Yeah. And I think that's great, man, because also it's, it's a really compelling sales pitch too, when you can really listen to people and sell them on what they want versus selling them on one of your programs, right? And being like, hey, you have a dog that's misbehaved and you want to get the dog trained. This is what I do. This is my program here. Um, you're, you're, it sounds like you're really listening to them and saying, you know, like if someone likes to go hiking and they want to have a really strong recall, you're like, yeah, we can absolutely do that. And the way that we're going to do that is through this program. Yeah. Um... And so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do things that way. You know, yeah. you got to, especially here where I'm, where I'm located, there's, you know, the cities aren't too far away, but then there's also people who kind of live like 
out in the sticks. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, so for, for sure. those people, they're like, I couldn't care less. My dog can walk on a leash. He's never on a leash. Like he spends right. 90% of his time just running around. Right. Um, That's more important to them that the dog is trained off leash. Right. So, yeah. you know, I, you know, I ask people, Hey, do you need off leash or do you need on leash? If you live in a city and there's leash laws, like I'm not going to try and talk you into doing off leash stuff. Cause you're right. not going to use it. You know what I mean? For sure. Um, so I'll knock out, you know, it, it's just primarily about catering to your clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, th- I think that's often overlooked though. I think a lot of people, you know, are like, this is what I do. These are my dog training programs. And they just try and sell people on what they're able to do instead of really focusing in on what are the, what does the client want and then selling them on that. And we all know that they're going to get those results through our training programs, but it all starts with figuring out what they want first so that we can really make it seem like at least that we're tailoring something specifically to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's been one of the you know more helpful things and it makes my life much easier as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I just want to touch on this real quick. I mean, I think that you, what you're, ha- what you have going on with the puppy program is awesome too. I remember that conversation we had, I think a lot of trainers overlook puppies and they go like, you know, is it really, I think they think that the information that they're giving to their clients is not that valuable. Um, but it is very valuable. Like when you have a puppy that's like tearing up the house and going to the bathroom in the house and crying all night long and all that stuff, like it totally disrupts your life. So for you, it's like you're essentially doing two sessions right now, right? For 500 bucks. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's largely educational. You're like, hey, here's the potty training or the, you know, housebreaking schedule, the crate training schedule, all that stuff. And people see a lot of value in that, it sounds like. Yeah. And and the thing is, like, there's no point in doing, in my opinion, there's not no point really doing much more than that because... Yeah. Because with puppies, a lot of it is just like an immaturity problem, right? The only thing that's going to solve that is time. So, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we could get together every week, but they're a puppy. Their ability to retain knowledge, you know, and it's just not as efficient as a dog that's five or six months old. So we're just kind of wasting our time and spinning our wheels. But I have had people, I feel like, you know, they haven't really expressed this to me, but I feel like people get puppies and they're kind of in over their head and they think that by calling a trainer, that'll stop everything. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, having a puppy is miserable yeah. for the first you have couple a puppy. Of months. It just yeah. is like, right. you know what I mean? There's nothing I can do to stop your dog from whining. He's eight months or he's eight weeks old and he just got pulled away from the litter. Like this is, yeah. If you want if you want a dog that doesn't make noise, go buy a stuffed animal. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I kind of feel bad because it, it, you know, from their perspective, it's kind of like, well, my dog is going to the bathroom in the house. He's whining in the crate. I called his trainer. We got together a couple of times. My dog's still doing this. Like, but that's exactly yeah, what I mean. I it's like it to him during the, you know, yeah. during the lesson, like the stuff that doesn't go away overnight. But you have to be consistent about this. Um, right. And know, I think so that. I think that though that that's like giving piece of people like you're giving them the education and that's a big piece of this. Right. And because I yeah. think what a lot of people are facing is they have a puppy and they're like, they don't know, is this normal? Am I doing something wrong? Is this ever going to stop? So I do think the fact that you go over there and you teach them like, Hey, this is normal behavior for a puppy. First off, you, you let them know that this is not abnormal. They're not, you know, dealing with something that no one else deals with it. Everyone deals with this when you have a puppy, but this is what you need to do to get yourself out of this phase, but it's a process. And it's not something that like we can just, you know, wave a magic wand and it's going to get taken care of. Uh, But I think that letting people know that the only way you're going to, you know, break this cycle is through consistency and putting like structure in place. And here's the schedules in order to do that. I think that that is really valuable uh, information for people. And I think that can often be overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm not much of a salesperson, like at all, man. I really like, yeah. I don't like, I just, <laughs> you say that, but then like, straightforward, yeah. you know, yeah. like, this is what I can do. This is, you know, what to kind of expect. And then I just kind of leave it at that because, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is tell somebody just what they want to hear. Mm. And then they decide to move forward. And then it turns into this big mess because, I under delivered on their expectations. I'd much rather just tell someone how it is from the beginning. You know, can you do a board and train for my 12 week old dog? Well, 
I can, but there's going to be like almost no retention. You're pretty much wasting your money. Like it'd right. be much better to do like a little puppy program so that when the dog is five or six months old, you know, yeah. and then that person may decide to call someone else or do a board and train with someone else that's going to take their dog. But right. um, I don't lose sleep over that stuff because it's no longer my problem. You know, right. if I'm upfront and honest with people and they want to go somewhere else, that's that's totally yeah not everyone's your... you know what i mean you got your yeah. freedom to choose and to find another option yeah i'm not and... the only option you know what I mean? totally so yeah I'll, I'll encourage people to go you know wherever yeah not everyone's your client you know that's something that i think we all have to realize and there's there's someone out there for everybody and that's the beauty of running a business it's like not everyone's your client and you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea either so you know right. i think that's just really what it comes down to but i do think the thing that you have on your side is that you know, there are very few dogs or problems that people are going to come to you with within inside the realm of like your average pet problems that you're not capable of fixing, right? Because some trainers won't take on like reactive or aggressive dogs at all, at all. Like you'll take on those dogs as well, right? Yeah, um, I'll do it as best I can. There's only been one dog that I kind of turned away. Yeah. Um, and this dog, it was an Australian <clears throat> shepherd and like, you know, people call you all the time. Hey, my dog's aggressive. Can you help me out? And I was like, all right. So I went over there, you know, some people say their dog's aggressive because they nipped someone five years ago that backed him into a corner and like stuffed their hand in his mouth. Right. Um, so a lot of times I go to these places, it's like, it's really not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this one dog was like an absolute monster. Like every time he looked at me, he just couldn't help himself. Like he would try to avoid looking at me, but the second he'd look at me, his hackles would come up, his teeth would start snarling. He'd run at me, um, try to bite me and stuff like that. So the only reason why I didn't take that dog is one, cause I have little kids here that, yeah. You know, and um, and I just didn't have a setup for it. Like the dog, he couldn't get the dog into a kennel. So if I can't get the dog into the kennel to even transport the dog, I'm not going to have a dog loose in my vehicle that's trying yeah, to kill seriously. me every time he looks at me. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, that was that was the biggest thing is that I just wasn't able to you know get him in a kennel. That was really for the sure. only thing that held me back from yeah um, from doing that. But. So that's yeah, a big, I mean, that's a big advantage in my opinion, I, not to cut you off. I just want to say this because yeah. I think a lot of trainers, you know, listen, there, there's a lot of dogs out there that, that are reactive and that are considered to be aggressive by their owners. And I think that if you don't take on those type of dogs, that's fine. You can still have a really good business. You don't need to strictly do that. Or, you know, you can have a good business without that. But I do think that I was just talking to another client about this, um, you know, that is a decent size of the market, right? Like when people are calling about that stuff because people can't handle that stuff on their own, right? So people that are dealing with those issues are gonna be much more likely in my opinion, at least to be reaching out for help, right? If they have like a small yeah. dog and it's just kind of annoying and pulls on the leash, it's like people can live with that. If they have a dog that's bit somebody or they have a dog that is really reactive towards people or other dogs, like people are gonna be much more willing to reach out for, for help a little bit quicker, I think. Yeah. And, and people often feed into that, right? Because what happens is, you know, they get a young dog, the dog's fine, the dog's fine with people, the dog's fine with other dogs that they think anyways. And then, you know, when the dog starts to mature, that's when some of the stuff starts to rise to the surface, right? So, mm. you know, the dog reacts in a way, they bite somebody, they bark at somebody, or another dog or whatever. And then the handler kind of, or the owners like freak out. Right. So what do they do? They're like, I'm not going on walks anymore. Right. So then they just leave the dog channeled up or inside the house. They don't let anybody meet the dog, which just further confirms like the dog's suspicion or fear. Um, right. And that's a lot of times what I see is people are just like, you know, I just worked with a dog that was, you know, a little bit aggressive like that and nipped a couple people. Um, and I was helping this lady out in her house and dude, the dog came out, hackles up at the end of the line, barking, like real stiff and rigid. And then we did like, a, a just a handful of things. Um, and then the dog just stopped entirely. And I was like, just cut the leash off. Mm. And she's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, he's fine. She cut the leash off and the dog just laid there, hung out, didn't bark, didn't growl, didn't do any of that. Yeah. Um, and not every situation is like that. And I think the reason why, and this is obviously just 
from my experience over time. Mm -hmm. And I also have a dog that is like, that. he does not like people. He's not friendly, mm. but I toured with him in 2018, right? I was on plane flights. I was in airports. I was all over the place with him. And, you know, people would ask to touch him or pet him. And I'd be like, no, he's just no. And they'd still sit there and stare at him. Like, as <laughs> no, if but I like all lying. dogs love me. Every dog yeah, loves me. As yeah. if I was lying. And then they'd look at him and like go to reef for him. And he'd yeah. start like growling. Um, and then he'd be like, oh, OK. And it's like, dude, I tried telling you. But, you know, it, as long yeah. as you've got really, really reliable obedience and you know the situations that your dog, like when you're dealing with genetics and aggression. Yeah there's a lot of management that comes into it, right? There's, yep. there's management and then there's training and there's ways that you can get around genetics through using training. So an example would be like if a dog is food aggressive, right? Some people put the bowl of food down, the dog starts eating it and then they snatch a bowl of food away. Right. I don't know why anybody would do that, but if, if a dog gets like is aggressive around food, right. And this is something that you just can't stop. If it's like a genetic thing that the dog just must resource guard, right. If you teach a reliable recall, you can stand on the other side of the room, call the dog to you. They come to you, tell them to lay down. You walk over there. Now they're not close to the food bowl anymore. Right. And you can pick it up and do whatever you want. So when you're dealing with genetics, I think people have a misinterpretation that like you can change it. Right. And training will help you work around those things, right? So my dog is, he doesn't like strangers, but if we're doing obedience and he's focused on what we're doing, I can walk him by everybody. He right. can be in the room. I can cut him off leash and he's fine. And, you know, if someone reaches to touch him or whatever, it's going to be a different story, but I know what his issues are. And how to avoid them. You know what I mean? I'm not going to cut them off leash into a group of people and just mm. be like, oh, don't touch them, please. <laughs> um, but I mean, and that's the other thing. I get lots of calls for, you know, aggressive dogs. And again, I just tell them exactly how it is over the phone. Look, there is going to be a point where the training is not going to help out. And it's just a matter of managing it for the, the rest of the dog's life. So if your plan is to keep the dog, then absolutely we'll move forward with training. But understand that training is not going to fix everything you right. know what i mean like there will be ways that we can work around this but this is probably going to be something that you're going to deal with for the rest of your life yeah exactly um, and it turns some people away and they'll call someone that'll say oh yeah i can get that to stop you know and i never hear from them again so hopefully yeah. they get their issue fixed but nine times out of ten it's it's, it's not be that a simple yeah. yeah yeah i think that from everyone that I've ever spoken with that, you know, when, when they work with aggressive or reactive dogs, I think that it all starts with setting the proper expectations with the clients. And, and exactly like you said, like, you know, you're not going to take your dog from Cujo to being like Lassie all of a sudden, you know what I mean? It's like, you need to just like live within the reality that this is, this is your dog. And this, this situation can certainly be improved and you can have a really nice quality of life, but you just have to be smart about it. Um, yeah. but that being said, you know, with, 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 I think that there is a certain, a certain amount of salesmanship that take needs to take place. Like you, I think that you need to also let people know that like, Hey, I can make your life better. Like we can certainly help with this, but at the same time, letting them know like the reality of it's never going to be, you know, like you don't need to worry about this at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I said, if you shoot it to them straight, you've done all you can, you know, whether they choose to go somewhere else or they stick with you at least if they stick with you you have a clear expectation um and you don't you know i i never tell people over the phone or anytime that mm. i can guarantee i can make their dog do anything right um you know i'll tell people you know out of the hundreds of dogs that i've trained i've not one time been able to have a dog that i couldn't get to walk on a loose leash mm -hmm. you know what i mean i'll tell them that but i'm not going to tell them like yeah i guarantee i'll be able to yeah, it's a great way to say things. Anything. Yeah, um, yeah, because because I've seen this with other trainers too, where like they, people can be insecure and they've maybe had a bad experience with somebody and have reinforced in them that like I'm never doing this again. I'm never telling, guaranteeing something again. And then what happens is like it comes across in their sales pitch is just very like unsure of themselves and their ability because like every question that somebody asks them, can you help me with this? And it's like, 
well, I don't know, because it all depends on your dog. And, you know, it's going to be de dependent on the situation. It's like, that's all true. But that also doesn't necessarily inspire confidence in your in your clients in you. If everything that you're saying to them has a caveat of like, you know, um, it all it all totally depends like on, on your dog, because even though that's true, we do kind of need to let people know, like, yes, we can we can help here at the end of the day. And I think that's a beautiful way of saying it, which is like, you know, I can't guarantee anything without meeting your dog first. But with that being said, I've trained a thousand dogs and I've never not been able to accomplish this before. Yeah. And I mean, the one guarantee that I would be willing to say to any client is yeah. that I guarantee your dog's going to be at least a little bit better than what you brought <laughs> to be with, you know? For sure. Um, yeah. Can't get any worse. I can guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, hey, man, I, what I'd love to do is like, you know, I know you, you're you you're watching the kids today, so you probably don't have all the time in the world. But the question I always ask everybody is like to somebody who is in your spot, um, you know, that's in your spot now that you were in, say, six months ago or a year ago, what would you recommend to them? Like, what if you could go back in time, like, what would you recommend to them? Um, for me. What I would recommend is just make sure that you can you can deliver number one, mm -hmm. and then number two, is like stop looking at the people around you, stop comparing yourself to all these other people that you see, you know, on mm -hmm. Facebook or whatever. If you know how to train dogs, then just start putting the work in, and everything is going to follow. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, including myself, you kind of you kind of talk yourself out of it. Um, like, yeah, that I never thought working at home would be an option for me at all, mm -hmm. much less working at home and probably making more money than I've ever made before. Yeah. Like that, I would have told you you're insane. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, but that would be my biggest piece of advice would just be to go for it. Like awesome. the only thing holding you back is you. And if you're allowing something else to hold you back, like you can't be letting, you can't let everything outside of what you can control dictate your life. Yeah. So figure out what you can do and then just start knocking that out. If you can, you know, for me, I didn't, I wasn't able to do board and train. So mm -hmm. looking back, if I had talked to you earlier, even if I couldn't do board and trains, I would have changed those private lesson packages. Yeah. And I would have still made way more money than what I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then once I built up, to the point where I could do board and trains, you know, thankfully we, you know, got in contact with one another yeah, um, and things started taking off. So I guess like, yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be my biggest piece of advice is just start small, take bite-sized pieces, but don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to take your shot, man. Like yeah. the only thing holding you back is you. And I know like for me personally, I'm a pessimist. Like I, I don't take risks. Yeah. I always see the worst. I had kind of hit the end of my rope there. Um, you know, I had a couple, a few, like some money saved up. I knew that I could do the training. I knew that I could like knock the expectations out. It was just a matter of getting people to me. That was the only link that I was, that I felt like I was missing. And when we started working together, I was missing the client link and I yeah. was missing the structure link too, which was, which I would argue is, you know, equally as important, if not more. Um, and that's when, you know, we started working together. You started bringing in a lot of these points. Um, you changed pretty much everything about how I did everything for the better. Um, yeah. I was open-minded about that because I knew obviously what I was doing wasn't working. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I could go back in time, what I would tell myself or anybody else who's looking to like do this for a living, do what you're doing right now, save up a, a, some money and then do start the marketing, man. Yeah. Um, because it is a risk. Like when we first talked, I was making like maybe two or $3,000 a month. Mm. And then I remember like, I was really hesitant to start working with you. And you're like, what's holding you back? And I was like, dude, like, I know it's not much money, but that's like literally like m the majority of my paycheck. Mm. You know what I mean? And you were just like, bro, just trust me. Like we <laughs> trust pay, this so. random guy that like sent you a message on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if I wouldn't have done that, then I'd be in the same boat that I was yeah. in. You know what I yeah. mean? And 
I'd be running all over the place, you know, five, six, seven, eight clients every week yeah, and still making like maybe two or $3,000 a month. Totally. Do. Um, so my biggest advice, whatever you're doing, do what you can be better at your craft, save up a little bit of money and just do marketing. Do try it for a month or two months. If it doesn't work out, then cut your losses. But right. it's, you know, it was a big leap of faith for me, but it's, it's definitely, it's more than paid off. Um, I love it, dude. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, it's all business and life. It's all about calculated risks. You know what I mean? And if you believe in yourself, all the marketing is going to do is just bring more exposure to your business, give you more opportunity. And that's what I see with a lot of trainers. Like there's a lot of great trainers out there, but they struggle with the business side of things because no one's ever shown yeah. them how, like, how would you possibly know how to market your business if you don't have a marketing degree or you never took any courses or never learned from anybody how to do it. Right. Like, yeah. I think there's kind of a misconception that we're business people. We're just supposed to know how to do everything, but that's just not how it works. There's a lot of things I don't know. There's a lot of things that a lot of trainers don't know. And so if somebody can kind of expedite that process for you, I pay people all the time. You know what I mean? If there's something I don't know, I have a blind spot in my, in my business and I could have somebody give me the information or plug something into my business that helps me grow it. Why would I spend a decade trying to figure it out myself, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that there, you know, there is a huge difference between, you know, just being a trainer versus being like a businessman, right. Or yeah. running your own business. And I know we had this conversation because when we first talked, you were like, you know, I come up from a family of like blue collar work, you know what I mean? So, so when, when I'm sitting back and I'm thinking about training dogs and making money, I'm charging by the hour, mm. right? Because every job that I've ever had is charged by the hour, right? You know what I mean? I've not ran my own business to the point where it's like, you're actually building a future for yourself. You're building yeah you know, you're building a name, you're building an actual business that's outside of yourself. So, you know, when I was thinking this, I thought I was practically stealing money from people because I was charging them a hundred bucks for yeah, five I bucks. Know. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, and now thinking back, it's like, I'm glad that I did it, but gosh, dude, like it was, I could have saved myself a lot of pain, but um, you know, that, that I think is the, big, the biggest issue that I had. Um, and then you brought the business side of it. Um, and then I tried a couple things, you know, that you had recommended and, and it made a huge difference immediately. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I see this with a lot of people, you know, where, where you come from a background where your, your, your parents or, you know, your aunts and uncles, like, and you know, you even grew up in like doing blue collar work. And like you said, everything was an hourly rate. And so those are like your standards and your expectations. And it's kind of hard to break that cycle and that mindset. Uh, and I think that keeps people stuck for a very long time is like being brutally honest. Like when you go to charge a thousand dollars for something, you're like, man, I wouldn't pay a thousand dollars for this. And if <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't pay a thousand dollars for it, you can have, you're going to have a hard time trying to sell it to somebody else. So, right. you know, I think that it all does start with the mindset and uh, really trying to have a shift there between being like an hourly worker who clocks in and clocks out at a job versus like, this is a business and I'm going to treat this as such. Yeah. And another thing going back to what you just said, um, you know, was about like how I was talking to people. Right. Because yeah. when I when people call me on the phone, I know if I'm talking to somebody and I'm going to spend that that much money, like I want to know that that person is competent. Right. So that well, that's what was going through my head, you know, the whole time I'm talking to these clients. Right. So, you know, they tell me what the issue is and I tell them like, this is how I'm going to fix it. These are the things I'm going to do. This is why this stuff works. Mm. Um, and I was just wasting a lot of time, you know, essentially running them through like the entire process of essentially yeah. how to train a dog over the phone. Right. And you're like, Hey man, like, <laughs> I remember this. Yeah. you know, it's going to be much better if you, you know, keep it like more kind of like goal oriented because, you know, these people, number one, they don't really, Either one, they're going to listen to you and then they're going to think that they can do it on their own mm -hmm. um, and you'll never hear back from them. Or yeah. they just kind of tone you out and they're like, dude, this dude just won't stop rambling. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know people, I mean? so yeah, they're calling you. Things, they're calling. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Zane. I keep things much shorter now. You know what I mean? And it is it's more of like a business approach to things instead of like approaching. I feel like if you're approaching clients as a trainer, you're not going to do as well or you're going to run yourself 
into the ground. When I'm talking with clients, I try to be like the business minded. Yeah, for sure. You know, the CEO and the CEO or owner, you know what I mean? Like whatever. But yeah. And then when I'm doing with the dogs, you know, now I can be a trainer. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? But that's when you're going to be a trainer. There definitely should be, at least for me, there had to be that difference there. Otherwise, you know, if a trainer is talking to somebody, gosh, dude, it just. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I listen to so long. many different, you know, phone calls because, you know, we record calls when they come in through ads and stuff like that. And the amount of times you're exactly right. Like I've heard people fix people's problems on the phone. They're like ready to hand over their credit card and like, hey, I want to do your board and train or your private training program or whatever it is. And they're like, well, have you tried getting a prong collar yet? Or have you tried using a bark collar or this crate or like, you know, whatever it is. And I'm like, you just like are giving them a solution to their, to their issue or, and, and we all know it's not really a solution, right? Like there's way more to the surf to the yeah, story right. than just like a quick five minute phone call, call. But at the end of the day, like you've given them enough to put a bandaid on the problem and they are going to, for a little bit of time, at least think that like, Hey, this is something that we can try. We haven't tried this yet. Uh, let's try this training tool or this new method that that dog trainer told us. And then it just takes the attention off of working with you. And then they're going to be right back to the same problem in a couple months, but they may not get back in touch with you. They might, but at the end of the day, like what, you know, what you were saying before, I remember talking about this with you is like, you were doing a lot of problem solving on the phone calls for people and training over a phone call instead of selling them on, like, like you said, being goal oriented and like, Hey, we can certainly help with that. Here's the programs that are going to be the best way of accomplishing that. Yeah. And like, you know, it is a much, I guess, if you think of it, if I think of it in a different way, it's much more relatable. You know what I mean? If you can be like, yeah, that really sucks. Like, I, yeah. I hate when my, you know, when I go in public, my dog is pulling all over the place. Like, that's something that's more relatable than oh, yeah, man. like trying to explain to them what classical conditioning and operant conditioning is like, do you, yeah. you know what I mean? They're like, okay, I don't see how this has anything to do with yeah. Why my dog's lunging at other dogs. Yeah. Well, it's um, funny because like you say that you're not a good salesman, but like you actually are because that's a really, really intuitive thing to do with people, which is like sometimes all people want is for somebody to sympathize and empathize with them. Be like, oh, I'm sorry to hear you going through that. It must be really stressful. You know what I mean? Like your dog's growling at people and like you have a newborn in the house. Right. And or whatever it is. And they're scared. And yeah. it's like you just kind of empathize with them and let them know, like, I see where you're coming from. And yeah, you're exactly right. Like that's people want to be taken care of in that regard and spoken to that way instead of like, let's talk about the most scientific reason for why this yeah, is happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but yeah, it's been good. It's been great. Um, I'm able to work at home. You know, I don't have to worry about taking any of those contract jobs anymore. Yeah. Um, Taylor Swift's nice. like probably bummed out that your business is doing so well. <laughs> yeah, I got uh, I got to do like a couple other military contracts and stuff after that that weren't yeah. dog related, um, and I did really enjoy those. But you know, we had you know another kid on the way, and my wife was just like, nah. "You got to figure something else out." You know, yeah, yeah. Um, you can't be leaving all the time. So yeah, I, dude, I just I'm so blessed, man. Um, Good dude to be able you to deserve work it, man. home and make more money than what I ever thought, um, you know, possible. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, is like being part of this community, man, a lot of things, you know, some of the videos and stuff that you've done with other clients have helped me out. Like I didn't know Lucas, we were friends on Facebook or whatever, but you know, watching his video and his interview yeah. and the way he approaches business, you know, I took a couple of those things, a couple of those, you know, things that he was doing, tried those out. And some of them worked, you know, so I reached out to him. I was like, hey, dude, I know you like you don't really know me at all, but, um, you know, you helped me out like just by, you know, helping helping other people out. You know, yeah. same thing with Tommy. You know, I've reached out to him a couple of times like, hey, man, who's this Kevin guy? Is he worth it? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, other questions and stuff like that. I think I think that there's a big there's a big like, I don't know stigma and dog training where it's like everybody is versus everybody but um you know there's plenty of different ways yeah yeah for sure um oh, i think you may have muted yourself oh there we go yeah i was just gonna say um 
Yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going to get value out of this video too, man. I mean, you know, you just never know what you can say or like what your what experience you had. And then you share that. And then all of a sudden people, it sparks something in somebody else. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you guys haven't already checked out those videos too, with Tommy and Lucas, those are great videos and we go pretty in depth about running a business. So, um, so yeah, man, well, Zane, is there anything else you want to share, share with anybody on the call today? Or I feel like we touched on a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, if you're thinking about it, just do it. Like, I'm not, like I said, the only thing when I first started all this, the only thing that I could do was train dogs. I didn't know anything about business or anything like that. I still don't consider myself to be knowledgeable in that regard, like at all. So, you know, if you keep waiting until everything's perfect before you start, you're going to, you're never going to start. Yeah. Um, so just go for it, man. Just get, get it done. I love it, dude. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, listen, we'll have to do another check-in maybe in a couple of months to see where you're at, but uh, I really appreciate you taking out the time today to uh, come and do this with me. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. All right, brother.